Hello everyone. Um, tonight we've got a special recorded version of MHTV. Um, so there'll be no um, interaction on Facebook or Twitter, but we do hope that if you've recorded it, you will um, drop us some messages on the hashtag. And um, and for those of our guests who are on Twitter, we'll also be able to um, forward those on as well. So tonight we're recording um, because we've got a time difference with our episode and our guests in a minute will um, give you a little bit of an overview of um, of the project and also where um, where we're interviewing them from. So tonight we're talking about healing and um, and the arts, and um, the project that we're talking about is um, is a really interesting and inspirational one. Um, it's about how to support children um, who are living in conflict affected areas, particularly Kashmir and um, ways of supporting their well being. So I'm going to first go over to um, our guests to give themselves an introduction and then we'll go over to Michael and Nicola who will give us a bit of an overview of the research. Um, so I'll start actually with Michael just going in order of who I can see on my screen. So over to you Michael just okay. to introduce yourself. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that and thank you for having us on the on the podcast and, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Michael Buser, and I'm a researcher at the University of West of England in Bristol. Uh, so um, my background is in my, the work that I do is generally described, I describe it, I guess, as socially engaged research and community oriented research uh, in a number of different, very different settings. Um, a, a large strand of my research is on environmental uh, well-being and, and water uh, security. Um, but also uh, we've been working with uh, this team here on, on well-being and, um, and mental health challenges. Um, my, uh, the way this project gets started, just to introduce it quite quickly, is I had previously worked with uh, some of the partners here, Anna Rupa, who you meet soon, uh, in a research in Rajasthan in, in India. And we worked on some water security issues and challenges um, with people in, in that area of the world. And Anna Rupa and I, I think, got along and then really uh, clicked in terms of uh, our working patterns and so on. So we've kept that relationship um, going. So I've been building up some relationships with partners in India for some time now. And, um, and so we've been expanding and, and exploring what we can do together. The fund, the project was, is a, was an 18 month project that really is just sort of ended here. Mm. Um, so it ran mostly through 2020 and uh, 2021. Um, in Pulwama in Kashmir, and was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council by their Global Challenges Fund. So Global Challenges is a fund that's specifically designed to support um, critical challenges outside of the UK, and particularly in areas of, um, of Global South, so places like India or Africa or so on. So, so this fits fit into that uh, criteria. And um, yeah, so I think I think in terms of um, other things about what the project is doing is we've been working with a school in Pulwama in Kashmir that has uh, with children who have been uh, living in in this area and have been affected by conflict for most of their lives and people other people will talk about that specific context I think in more detail, but primarily what we have done is we've engaged the school through a very in depth arts and well being program that worked with yeah. about 30, 30 participants or so across this 18 months um, to draw out the role of the arts and draw out their, their, uh, their well-being and to support them uh, and to understand their emotional challenges and to hopefully uh, provide a, long, uh, a long-term impact and benefits to, to, their, to their mental health and their, and their well-being. Um, so I think others will probably speak more specifically about some of those uh, sort of uh, outputs and so on. But I think that's probably just for, I'm not sure how long we have here. So for brevity, that's probably all I should really say. And maybe turn yeah. it over to yeah. whoever's next in line. I noticed that somebody's frozen. Vanessa's frozen. Maybe I've got, I'll just. Um, uh, yeah. Can you see me? Can you see me? Yeah. Sorry, it must be the um, the signal and the weather probably here in Yorkshire at the moment. So um, I'm thinking it might be 
go over to Nicola next because I know Nicola were involved with um, the project from the beginning as well. So do you want to introduce yourself and give everyone a little overview of, of your involvement and your background as well? Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. So hello. Yes, I'm um, Nicola Holt, oh. also an academic at the University of the West of England. I'm in the psychology department. And um, yeah, I met Michael one day when he was looking for people to help get the idea going to do work um, in Kashmir using the arts. And um, we had a chat about my work because I'd been doing work evaluating arts for wellbeing with adults with anxiety and depression in the UK. And so my role was to help evaluate and try and find measures to um, explore the impact of the arts intervention on the children's well-being. So we were involved then when the project began, um, chatting with Vikram and Anna Rupa and the school about how we should measure the impact on the children. And based on those discussions, it took, it was interesting, it took a turn different than I expected. And um, that was because um, it was really became apparent that it was important to be really ethical and sensitive in the way we measured the well-being of the children. And we took a very sensitive approach in order to not directly ask the children any questions, for example, about things that might have happened that might indicate post-traumatic stress and take a non-invasive approach to the evaluation to not maybe trigger or traumatise the children by being too invasive and asking them to verbally articulate yeah. some of their experiences. So mm -hmm. our strategy was to um, use um, their artwork and use um, observations from by different members of the communities such as the art therapists and teachers and, and staff in the school observing the children's behaviour so it's indirect so that the children could literally just enjoy the art making and not feel like they were subject to an experiment so that was really important to the team yeah yeah absolutely thank you okay um should we go over to Vikram next if that's okay yeah do you want to just introduce yourself as well yeah. So, hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Vikram. I am an art space therapist. Um, I also uh, direct plays for young children in, in schools. Uh, I'm a theatre maker. So I've been mostly my work has been in children in conflict with law and social conflict um, for, for the good part of my years. It's been 26 years of working in the field of social development sector. Mostly I looked with runaway children and worked in juvenile homes and um, but the work in Kashmir has sort of evolved uh, since last 10 years um, and yeah. since 2012. <clears throat> Anurupa and I went to Sri Lanka to work with the reconciliation projects and peace development initiatives between Tamil and Sri Lankans. So from there, I sort of got a vision uh, of working in Kashmir and other conflict areas in India, which has been militarized and um, there are certain laws which are quite not right in that sense. And so we, uh, I mean, I landed up there and I started working with various schools and orphanages and and um, various different art parts of the society in a sense, like so that I could do art space intervention, you know, and to look at a need assessment uh, or yeah. uh, see the lay of the land. And then it is only um, I sort of zeroed into Pulwama about um, during that time and somehow remain connected and committed to one particular school over the years. And that is a school we have sort of done the research on. And um, and this is during 2020 when when the world shut down somehow miraculously yeah, the work opened up and uh, and the world of this particular world opened up in a sense um, and we got a systematic larger support to continue the work uh, with the children so yeah so I I I I I mean it's it's the project has been very interesting because we've sort of taken the children on a, the students on a journey and yeah. with the metaphors and um, we've seen systematic shifts and changes in them during last year in a COVID we were there in a sense during while COVID was on 
we sort of moved there and we worked, even where the school was shut, we sort of managed to do some work online and offline and online and offline. And within this sort of, uh, within this movement, we managed to uh, bring a lot of transformation within the children by using, facilit using the arts as a facilitative tool. Yeah creating holding spaces, creating spaces where they could find themselves and unfold. So it's been pretty exciting. Yeah, very yeah that's my good. introduction and yeah. 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 And where, where are you based usually? Um, I'm, I'm both, I'm, I mean, I mean, I'm based in New Delhi and uh, that's my base. I'm, I'm in the capital and I sort of move around from yeah. here. Yeah. And you're joining us from here, from there to there. Pardon, sorry? You're joining us from New Delhi today. Yes, yes. For, yes, yeah, right yes, now at this particular point, I'm in New Delhi. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, finally, should we go over to Anirupa? Um, would you like to um, introduce yourself as well? I know we said we'd just do introductions, but I think if you want to give you a, an overview as well, that would be great of your involvement. And also for people listening, if you let us know where um, where you're joining us from as well today. So I'm uh, Anurupa, Anurupa Roy. I live in New Delhi, work out of New Delhi most of the time. I'm uh, a puppeteer and a, a director for Puppet Theatre. I work with children as well as adults. Uh, I run an organization called the Katkatha Puppet Arts Trust. Mm -hmm. And um, my colleagues and I in Katkatha are essentially, we work as a traveling puppet theatre company and we go to festivals okay. and schools and universities. Yeah. But we also uh, work a lot in uh, um, socially engaged theater with communities, uh, with women, with uh, adolescents, with children. And uh, um, uh, in in our work, the arts are at the very center of everything we do. Um, yeah. It's masks, materials, objects specifically. And, um, and so the project in Kashmir was actually very interesting because it's a coming together of so many things. Um, it's, uh, as Michael mentioned, uh, a, a further exploration of the work that uh, Michael and I have been doing together. It started with Rajasthan and now it was in Kashmir. It's uh, with Vikram, who's a very, very old friend. It's a continuation of the work that Vikram and I have been doing in, uh, in Sri Lanka and continuing to work in conflict zones. Uh, and also Manipur, which is in the northeast of India. We've both worked yeah. there. Um, uh, this project became a, a very systematic research of the impact of arts interventions mm. in communities, especially among adolescents and children who live in a conflict zone. Um, also, um, what was very exciting about this project is uh, I was in Kashmir in 2006 working with young women and yeah. to go back um, yeah. in a changed circumstance with a deepened conflict, almost mm -hmm. a generation had grown up and yeah. uh, um, to, was also very interesting to see uh, how internalized violence um, had really taken root uh, in Kashmir. So it, this is a project in many ways, it's, it's you know, sort of a culmination or, or a, um, a completion of cycles of many things that had been running. So yes, um, yes, this this was my uh, part in the project. Yeah. So did you see some of the same people who generationally you'd seen um, years before in the work that you'd done before? So in two thousand six, I was in a village called Bijbihara, uh, mm -hmm. which was uh, on the highway, uh, the main highway, and hence very vulnerable to. Um, you know, all the conflict that happened between convoys, army convoys that passed and uh, separatist groups, etc. Um, Pulwama, on the other hand, um, has been recently a part of a very, very deep conflict. Um, and uh, there, I haven't met the same group of people, but yes. a similar age of young women. Yeah. And you can see how things have, one can see how things have changed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, from from this kind of conflict between uh, the uh, Indian Army and the separatist groups, it's almost become a, a conflict of um, internalized violence. It's not so external anymore. It's yeah. how families who live in conflict cope with their uh, with conflict. How much do they safeguard their young 
So how oppressive is the safeguarding? Uh, how yeah. do schools run or not run? And what do they do when they are shut down? And the impact of the impact on children of being so isolated uh, within their community, as well as, you know, as the state of Kashmir, which is so isolated from the rest of India because of uh, the military presence, um, are, are, I think, a more intense conflict right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And because we really see where um, the arts might benefit in terms of children being able to express themselves through through the arts. Yes, yeah. I think uh, uh, part of the thing is, of course, expression, but and, and, and of course, Vikram will elaborate on it. It's also the arts become a diagnostic tool to a large extent. They, they're also yeah. able to tell you where this young person is and it's possible to study a journey that a young person makes over a period of time and you see the impact of sustained arts interventions and what it could create. So apart from well-being and it being a psychosocial intervention, it also builds a community uh, which didn't mm. exist before. It's a community of uh, peer-led community with teachers, with children, with the school, uh, with the parents and the school. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And um, and why did they choose this? Why did you choose the school in particular? Was that because of relationships that were already existing with that school? Yeah, Vikram, or was there... Vikram would have to have. Yeah, um, Vikram, yeah. did you want that? Yeah, so. so... So this particular school uh, was always open um, to the work of the arts and there were organizations working before I started working. There were peace organizations working with the school and within the town itself. So um, we already had some sort of a groundwork there. Um, when I started working in 2000, and, well, I started 2012 and um, yeah, 2012, 2013, at that particular time, they were doing smaller interventions using events, using concepts and conversations about what, what is peace, what is peace education, how can we mm. incorporate and bring that about uh, in people's lives. So, in fact, I have seen uh, over the years, children grow up um actually with the conflict in the last eight years um yeah. teenagers who i worked with are now um young adults in fact we have one of them on the team uh, her name is afifa she's a fellow researcher she was my student and so uh she her brother there were a whole lot of them who sort of grew up in front of me and so i can actually tell you the shifts and changes they yeah. have made in their lives by the choices they have made uh, because the arts came in their life very early and this idea yes. of a macro view of such, which is beyond the landlocked island uh, of uh, Kashmir, because it's also a valley, it's also, you know, at a height and geopolitically it is also very precarious. So in a way they were always cut off, but somehow they got a macro view, the eagle view, mm. instead of the worm view, which was the daily view of constant struggle. They had this larger view because of the arts. And yeah. uh, and the chairman of the school was was very friendly to the idea of outsiders coming and doing work. So in 2018, I stayed. I lived in Pulwama for a year, and uh, I was I was part of the school actually, and I did daily yeah. work. So I created the groundwork for to, to 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 sort of hone in to a particular specific teachers uh, students. Yeah, yeah. I also yeah. worked with the teachers also. So simultaneously, there were two conversations going on, one with the teachers and one with the students. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about the teachers, actually, whether um, they were involved at all. Um, presumably, what we were just talking about, some of the diagnostic issues that might have emerged. Um, were the teachers involved around um, providing support and, and were they the people that you went to where there were some concerns noticed with some of the students that you were working with? Um, I think the teachers know? also needed to be supported because as yeah. adults live in that the same environment as the cheap yeah. children, it's really a double whammy because you're responsible yeah, that... for and yourself yeah. and at the end of the day, uh, uh, the teachers need a whole lot of support uh, to uh, be able to be supportive to the children. I think um, one of the interesting things that we were able to build is what we call the Kalakar Kasba. The Kalakar is the artist and the Kasba is the community. Yeah. And the stress on the community became 
teacher, student, peer learners, peer educators. Um, and even after we had left, um, there would be messages and phone calls to Vikram and I uh, with new children who were not a part of the project asking if they could be a part of the project. Mm -hmm. So the fact that word had gone around in the community yeah. and you know, children had this continued practice. Um, teachers uh, is a challenge because a lot of uh, most of these schools uh, uh, have teachers who leave very quickly. Yeah. Uh, leave for better, easier, uh, of course, uh, um, less less difficult posts. Um, so the ones who stayed on and the ones who would be able to sustain the project is, of course, a very big question mark of who yeah. would be able to do it. While we were running the project, we had a fantastic art teacher. We had a FIFA who Vikram mentioned, who mm. was uh, um, also researching the project. So. Um, yes, and they, 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 I think till date remain a very important part of the project and a reason for it to continue beyond yeah. uh, uh, the the time limit of this project. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking um, in terms of, you know, some of the school approaches that we're doing in the UK, which is around, um, you know, whole school approaches and, and working with them. Um, you know, working with teachers, for example, and so they're more skilled up around mental health. And in a way, there's some sort of similar parallels with this, although, you know, clearly the sort of trauma context is is very different, but um, I can see parallels around, you know, working directly with schools and the, the sort of school community. And as you say, you know, the, the need to support the teachers as well, who are living through conflict as well and have grown up in conflict and the potential for them being continuously re-traumatised as well by other young people's experiences as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I, if I should just interrupt yeah. one, really quickly, just to say one one last thing about sort of the, the background. And I, I really like to develop a little bit about the specifics about what happened yeah. um, in, in the project itself. Um, but just also to say that the, the relationship with the school has been so amazing and to have the involvement of the teachers and the founder of the school and the principal of the school, yeah. Lopa and Farouk, who have, you know, so really it's all testament to Vikram's long term relationship with these with this community. Yeah. Um, so it it's it's this so it's it's it's. Um, it really represents um, a lot of trust building that has been going on there for for quite a long time um, that uh, we were lucky enough to be be part of and to and to build on, um, and and also to say also that there's a wider team who you know there's only so many people we thought we yeah. could bring bring to this um, yeah. reflect you know but um, but actually I was I wanted to say that um, we have um, a website that is called. Um, uh, it's artofhealing.org.uk. I'll put it in a chat or something like that. Yeah, um, we'll share that as well. But you yeah. can you can you can link through that to Kalakar Kasba as well, which shows more of the the student work and especially some of the videos, and I and and so the outputs that the students made, the participants in the project, are absolutely amazing. Um, mm -hmm. From from individual work that they did during um, COVID restrictions on their phones. Um, through interaction with Vikram and, and Anarupa to performances that they that they um, you know performed uh, live in front of their parents in the community and then and then also recorded it is absolutely amazing so I think yeah. you know the the content obviously of what they did yeah. is it uh, so it, it's to me it's what sort of set this project out a little bit because it yeah. wasn't simply we got actually a little pushback from some of the the reviewers on the application because we called it art art therapy, art-based therapy, and art activities, because yeah. it, it wasn't really just art therapy. It really was arts that they they were involved in, and our team was, and, and it's really amazing stuff that that they, they actually yeah. produced. So, you know, I just yeah. want to make sure that 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 element of the actual content of what what they what they did is 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 present, I suppose. Absolutely. And we'll share we'll share that link as well later on um, on social media as well. I mean, it, it does sound like such a, an inspirational project, um, clearly. I mean, um, what were the particular challenges that you experienced with the project overall in terms of the process and, and, and I guess, the work? Yeah, I mean, um, it, I just, just, just to say my part quickly and then turn to Anna Rupa and Vikram is, interestingly, because we, we planned this before COVID restrictions and COVID was really dis widely discussed, 
So we were intending a lot of face-to-face -face interaction from, from the UK academics as well, but none of the UK academics have traveled, and been, but everything has gone on Zoom. And interestingly, that um, actually I think improved the project um, yeah. because we didn't have to travel. Um, we yeah. probably would just have been in the way, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Oh, and it, it, yeah, and it allowed the Indian-based team to really take leadership on what actually was was going to happen. Um, so I thought it was actually <laughs> that challenge. I think in many ways benefited the, the project. Probably we saved some money, which we shifted towards web resources rather than 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 international travel. Of course, saved on some carbon footprint as well. But I mean, Vikram and Anarupa can speak to the specific day-to-day -day challenges. Yeah. Yeah. And also interesting to hear from you both about how what the challenges were once that went online as well. Um, as you say, some opportunities as well. I think the, the, the key challenge was that everything had shifted. It wasn't possible to visit Kashmir when we began. And also there had been an internet lockdown for mm -hmm. a long, long time. Uh, so we were working online uh, and the first visit was by, by Vikram in November. He'll, he'll tell you uh, some more about that. Uh, so the key challenge was um, COVID, COVID-related restrictions, and Kashmir uh, uh, had been uh, uh, locked down before COVID had, had hit Kashmir because of Article 370 and the banning of the article and the big military presence. There was almost a six-month uh, lockdown mm -hmm. on all internet. Um, so it was very challenging to start. We were on 4G in New Delhi and they were on 2G, which meant very poor connections. Yeah. So the children could either be heard or they could be seen. And yeah. uh, um, and it was, uh, uh, we, we found ways like we would do audio, almost audio interactions. And when they created something, they would take pictures and WhatsApp them to us. So we had these active WhatsApp groups with artwork mm -hmm. coming in to them. Um, and we um, worked with, uh, will we be able to go to Kashmir or not, uh, given the situation with mm. COVID back then? And uh, Vikram yeah. went in November in a lot of cold. And then very fortunately for us, we were there in the month of um, March and April. And in May, mm -hmm. we were hit by the second wave, which was terrible in New Delhi. So to just have that little margin yeah. where we could go to Kashmir, work physically, face to face yeah. with the children and do all these arts projects uh, was really a little bit of a miracle yeah. because if it was any later, yeah. the second wave would have hit and uh, it was absolutely impossible. To yeah. yeah, 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 Vikram, yeah. Must be yeah. yeah, so so my challenges, I mean, what, what the kind of challenges I face particularly, uh, uh, well, there were two challenges I think Anrup and I both faced it um, when when the children often in the first go in, during the internet, they wouldn't come online or they would sort of not yeah. put their things on because A, it was difficult with the 2G, mm -hmm. but B, also because mm -hmm. they didn't know exactly what was happening, you know. So uh, in a way, they they were playing along but it was kind of um for them it wasn't real yet uh that was the first time yeah. and then yeah. when i went there and then we actually produced a show and uh, the the first shadow puppetry and where their parents came and saw it and they actually evolved the narratives they fused the single narratives to collective narratives and they actually performed their various shows and they constructed and Anurupa was also guiding with, uh, you know, on Zoom, as well as I was sort of with them hands on. And I was also doing this whole work with the paintings on, which was more internal work. So um, all of them then sort of, they understood what was going on and they started taking ownership of the stories and the narratives. And that was a shift yeah. around, you know, that was a very critical point. When the next yeah. time when I came online, she distinctly saw the shift between what the students had sort of gone through and how responsive they were. And they were much more uh, with their, I mean, we actually saw, it was like, almost like we, the indicator of change, the indicator of change was quite visible that they were now coming online. They were talking much more, they were discussing much more. Mm -hmm. um, my essential challenge in the November number one was the 
weather was god awful because like i was not used to it yeah. and um, um because because the school is uh, is uh, is is large and is cemented and scored is they, they don't have central heating at all and it was like going minus one or zero and and and, uh, and i come from a warmer space mm -hmm. so it was very difficult and then the children uh, uh they had to work with their hands and so you know often often my hands wouldn't work you know so so it was like it was quite it was quite harsh that was number one number two <laughs> with uh, number yeah. two was um yeah. the, the boys wouldn't the, the many boys wouldn't come they wouldn't come on uh offline also and they would drop out and they had they, they had very um preset notion and they thought that working with the arts was very girly or you know or not really they were not really kosher with it and they would and their fathers would yeah. sort of also not really support um, them coming at least two three of them so we had a lot of dropout of boys and and that's when i thought uh, mm. I, had a, I had a brain wave and i thought to myself let's get yeah. younger boys in and uh, we got the principal and mm. they were very sweet to organize younger boys and they were absolutely a delight and they were very very nice and the responsive yeah. and creative and and uh, and that's when we had this breakthrough and understanding that if we work on boys because you know boys disappear young boys are taken as human shields they are the ones who get the brunt they are the ones who pick up the gun the stones and and they are pushed uh, in the forefront and it's terribly patriarchal, patriarchal mm -hmm. at many levels and yeah. uh, as, as as any place in south asia but conflict yeah. zones make it far more intense um boys need to have that kind of intervention and that's when we thought of early interventions with the boys yeah and if we do or when we manage to work with uh further on in conflict we would like to work more uh, i mean we would like to do early intervention with the boys you know rather than to come uh, at a later stage when they have emotional mm -hmm. shutdowns so it was very clear that they had emotional shutdowns they had you know they wouldn't the older boys they wouldn't be responsive they would do some uh terrific work and their art would frighten them yeah. because they felt exposed and so as soon yeah. as they touched upon some very critical points in their art journey or in their journey of expression they would back off you know so i think yeah. that was a, that was a that was a very um, big challenge for me during that time and we sort of tackled it by having a younger set of boys and they they stuck through and in fact they were the day and in fact when you see them now when you actually see them now a little bit they're still responsive and i say they're very eager and they're still open you know the life changing really yeah i I, I like to say something here just before i sort of round up here i mean i think one of the thing, key things because i have just come back from kashmir again my projects yeah. my other work is continuing and i had this insight this time uh because i work with teachers and i had this insight and i like to share that and the insight is that you know what the arts really do for children they actually help them to dream because if you look at the word trauma uh, and you look at the german root from it it comes from the word traum which also means a bad dream and i think what happens in conflict areas because there's daily everyday violence which is naturalized yeah. and you know um you know completely naturalized with the season um they have they, they stop dreaming they stop thinking that there is a future and what imagination does essentially is actually is opens up the prospects of dreaming and especially we did a lot of work in fantasies with fantasies so that allows them to have a, a separation from their everyday nitty gritty gruesome mm -hmm. existence and they have an they have a distance they have an artistic creative distance to look at their own realities through the lenses yeah. of fantasies and they can extrapolate which all the students did in front of the audience um and towards the yeah. end of the project yeah 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 that's amazing isn't it i can totally see that with um with with you know lots of people that i've i've met along my own way who are creative and and how they've kind of um become creative often out of quite traumatic experiences that they've turned to the arts but also it's giving people a legitimate opportunity isn't it to kind of deal with some of the trauma rather than suppress it and not talk about it because even if they're um you know expressing it in a metaphorical way through the arts it is still a way of processing and dealing with trauma yeah um, and just to add to what Vikram is saying is I think one of the key things we noticed is um, in the arts projects, um, there was a lot of uh, focus on skills and building skills mm -hmm. and covering their own skills. 
um, there was a, a, one of the girls who was painting a wall mural and it was almost um, um, eight meters long. And, uh, you know, she began by a little, little very shy, little uh, mm. brush strokes. And in about four days, she was doing these giant brush strokes <laughs> on the wall. And she was really confident. And she said something like, um, I have discovered a forgotten language. Wow. So it's like she had known this, but yeah. she didn't know that she knew it. And I think yeah. there is an um, unleashing of something that happens. Yeah. The ability of like Vikram is saying dreaming, also seeing your dreams manifest on a wall or, or, yeah. or in film or in clay, and then realizing that that's um, agency. You have that yeah. agency, yeah. which yeah. being in conflict constantly seems missing. But actually yeah. it isn't missing. It, it, it might be less sometimes. So... I think what we saw the children do is discover the, the agency that they have and yeah. uh, to also build this little community where collectively the agency was even more. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think it's uh, not just disclosure of uh, you know personal stories through metaphors, mm -hmm. it's also yeah. transformation yeah. Uh, yeah. because you have the possibility to change the story or change the ending of the story. Uh, mm. That was very, very uh, uh, power powerful for us to uh, see. Absolutely. And one of the things I'm wondering is we've talked a little bit about gender in a sort of patriarchal culture. Was uh, um, How did that manifest in the art that was produced? Were there specific themes that emerged around the genders? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. There was a, a team of just girls and uh, they... Uh, the, the the story, which was a mythical story, which was a, 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 um, a story that they made up, was about a princess who was disinherited by her father because she was a girl. And the mm -hmm. kingdom was handed over to the nephew. And when uh, we did, we had discussions about what is the meaning of the story in real life for them. They all spoke about being physically disinherited yeah. and also... Uh, not given the same status as the boy in the family and having that kind of say in their lives. Um, mm -hmm. It was very exciting because now one of them, or actually two of them, uh, they plan to start the first art gallery in Pulwama. And one of the girls has changed one of the rooms in our house into an arts room where wow. children from the neighborhood are invited in to paint. <laughs> Call so themselves the so yeah, yeah. So also impacting on our community as well. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. they were very, they were very vocal about um, um, the voice of women. That this had to be the voice of uh, uh, their yeah. voices as women, and uh, this was sort of a reclaiming of a certain space yeah. um, in uh, in their communities for themselves. Uh, and that was very exciting, though I must say it's uh, uh, all the girls we worked with, um, they really did have, uh, uh, they, they really uh, knew their minds. Uh, they weren't very vocal about it initially, but they knew their minds. And I think what the process gave yeah. them uh, a, a more opportunity to really articulate themselves. But I would say yeah. that they already did have quite a mind of their own and they were they were quite fantastic yeah. and free. There's also uh, something really interesting about these final performances in these in these stories. In addition to the the, the gender theme, uh, yeah. I think also what was what was interesting, if you kind of look at all the stories and 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 um, that were created, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, understanding of of um, uh, loneliness comes up uh, quite a bit, as well as some sort of kind of like dispossession or some sort of un uh, unjust betrayal actually comes out quite a lot in the stories. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, in this sort of um, this sort of these sorts of narratives of of loss as well. Um, you know, there's certainly a few few yeah. uh, you know traumatic you know moments in the stories of pe people's people's you know, demise and so on. So, so yeah, there were, it's really, it's really quite interesting. The the variety of themes that work their ways into the stories and the performances, mm -hmm. and how they, how they, how they were reflected. Um, it was really fascinating. Yeah. 
Amazing. Just want to add, add one particular point about the yeah. idea of forgotten language is that when when they discovered that or they unfolded that they could actually paint like that or they could make, I mean, there was never been puppetry in the sense the way it should be the shadow puppetry, paper theater, and they actually discovered their skills and their selves. Um, I thought to myself that uh, that there, there there has been a certain kind of uh, resilience that sort of built up because yeah. they sort of remembered, you know, and as as opposed to being dismembered, you know, so yeah. this fragmented landscape of their own minds and this bad dream of everydayness, you know, of of not having school for two years, not having connection with each other, suddenly they're meeting together. It's a child centric <laughs> space, you know, where yeah. they are building this participate uh, you know there's a participation there's a participatory language in a sense which comes about mm -hmm. and what happens is resilience comes about they're able to then um you know represent themselves in a public forum and actually talk about you know especially these girls who had done these displays they actually talked about what they wanted from society and they were asking questions at the end of the play and i think this this sort of created uh, this kind of re resilience and yeah. um, which was very much present, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like it was that community resilience as well as individual resilience. And mm -hmm. I love the idea that they were then going on and influencing oh. their peers as well, which is great, isn't it? One thing I wondered, because you mentioned about younger children and older children. So what was the age range of children that you worked with? Um, like what was the youngest and what was the oldest, just to get an idea of... 12 to 16. 12 11, to 12, 11, yeah. 11, 11 to 16, 17. Yeah. Mine was 11. Yeah. 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 So the younger children, they were about 11 or were they younger? Was it? Yeah, about 11. 11 was the youngest. Yeah, yeah. So was that, was it like um, a high school from 11 to 16 or is it a school that follows children all the way through from when they uh, start? They, they ended at uh, grade 10. Um, yeah. Which would be 16, 17, yes. Right, from yeah. junior 16. Yeah. And then yeah. we go on to senior school elsewhere. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, Nicola, I do want to come in with anything at this point. No, not particularly. It's oh, been really oh. wonderful hearing. Yeah. We weren't on the ground, so it's so amazing <laughs> hearing, <laughs> always hearing what happened there. Um, we were in the UK kind of thinking, I was thinking about how to evaluate and pro process the change. And I think that's shown more clearly through the actual arts artifacts themselves and through some interviews which Vikram did with the children at the end. We brought along some of their art and talked to him about their experience. And in, in relation to what Vikram was saying, I think it's really um, kind of salient in some of those interviews about this idea of almost post-traumatic growth and feeling mm. that they can now see a different future, which I think comes through in the interviews a bit. Mm. Like they're talking about a different identity, even of themselves as having agency, like you were saying, Anna Rupa, and having a sense of themselves as an artist and being able yeah. to communicate through the arts. And being able to vision, envision a future where things are more positive and they can use that as a resource and feel empowered to turn to the arts on their own after the scaffolding and the support they've had to help them process things in the future as well. So I think the idea of post-traumatic growth and being able to envision a positive future came through quite powerfully in those interviews. Yeah, and I think... I think the main challenge for me was trying to think about how we could document the process and, and the change and we still have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. um, looking at how to use art space methods for example to document that through the, the artwork the children have made so for me um, we're still kind of, I'm still kind of in the middle of my, <laughs> my journey <laughs> yeah. looking at the outcome and working out how to document the change. Yeah. yeah, Nicola's underplaying what she's done. I mean, there, there, are, there is, there is, um, there, there is a huge 
spreadsheet that that she's created that takes you know five or six different tests that were done through the course of the project that she's mm. compiling and correlating the problem is she's so meticulous and held holds data to such a high standard that you know she's yeah. very very wow. concerned about you know the rigor and so but it is quite quite fascinating the amount of information that was collected it's incredibly yeah. highly documented project Mm. Um, and 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 you know the I suppose the veracity and the the validity of some of the data is but that's one of the challenges I suppose yeah. that maybe Nicola can speak to yeah. that we are distant uh, mm. it's it, it, it's it's kind of hard to 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 conduct some of the tests uh, yeah. fully um, so I don't know if Nicola you want to say anything yeah. further about the that would yeah. be great. We had quite a rigorous plan to um, collect different stages of data at the beginning, um, kind of middle and end of the interventions. So this was based around trying to get the perspectives indirectly of the children's well-being from different people they were interacting with. So we use an established measure, which is a child behaviour checklist, which has been used in this kind of context before to document various changes in the children's behaviour, where the teacher completes a formal administrative staff. And it asks about things like, are they particularly agitated in class? Are they finding it difficult to concentrate? Do they seem tired? Are they interacting well with their peers? Do they seem able to communicate? Do they seem anxious or depressed? Are they being yeah. hostile or aggressive in class? It's based on their behaviours in the class. Obviously, with it moving online, it was quite challenging <laughs> for some of the teachers to respond um, to very recent behaviour or they might have only seen them online and might not have seen them in the school for a while. So there were some challenges with that, which were overcome by finding appropriate staff. Um, mm. And we used measures, we used a measure which um, we adapted slightly to fit the needs of the project to Anna, Anna Rupert and Vikram. Um, we adapted the scale and art therapy checklist, which has been devised by art therapists to to record their observations about the children when they meet them and at subsequent stages. So we had the perspectives of the artists and art therapists working with the children and of the teachers and school staff. Oh, and some of the problems with that, like I've indicated, is the staff, the school teachers, maybe not seeing the children as much as they had been doing if they were at home in, in the lockdown. And also we had um, different staff and I know had different response biases were more likely, we all do this, some people are more likely to hit the screen scores, some people stay in the middle, like maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, so with having different staff rating the children, there were a few um, problems with like maybe, that's why I'm being cautious about interpreting the data yeah. because of yeah. some of the issues and challenges. But the, the findings were nevertheless quite interesting and suggested that the teachers were seeing less disruptive behaviour, less aggressive behaviour, less hostile behaviour in the school setting. And the data from the art therapist was interesting, suggesting um, being able to articulate experiences um, more clearly through the arts and through narrative, um, being able to seem to be more mindful of their own experiences and showing more indices of, of mindful attention, for example. So all of these um, indicators seem to indicate kind of a positive trajectory in that sense. Yeah. We also tried using some, um, more formal um, art tests, so Vikram crept in without necessarily alarming the children, um, a human figure test which has been used to look for um, indices of um, emotional distress in children. So we had um, as a formal test where, for example, very extremely small drawings are thought to indicate feeling small and insecure and not able mm -hmm. to fully express one's feelings. And there are various indices like missing eyes or missing hands that are thought to indicate distress. So we scored those drawings as well and did notice I was scoring those um, with someone else for inter-rater reliability, a research assistant. And it was really noticeable how the drawings were much bigger, um, mm. more fully drawn without missing body parts. Um, there were things in there which aren't scored as well, which I noticed like in the second ones, obviously masks had been introduced. So <laughs> lots of the human figures were wearing masks. So you could see how the context was changing around them, but they were generally um, showed fewer signs of distress at the second stage. So we have various 
indices to try and look at the, the trajectory. We also had a plan, which was one of the challenges. We were planning to, um, there's an ops observation scale, which has been developed to look at how people are engaging over periods of time in each art se session. Um, so we were interested originally to use that to look at children's emotions and attention while making art. But obviously because things moved online, that was a, um, a challenge and we couldn't have a researcher there to do that because obviously you can't do that while you're running your sessions. Yeah, um, of yeah. <laughs> so instead we, we um, had the Zoom Yeah, that's awesome. So this is still in, in process really, but we um, developed an observational scale, which um, I'm still in the process of, of going through really to try and look at children's engagement in the Zoom sessions and to see how that's changing over time. Yeah. Are they talking more, showing more signs of trust with their therapist? Are they um, showing more signs like smiling or of being engaged with the artwork more as time progresses? So yeah. we're hoping that might have some interesting results and yes. um, maybe even be a future as more digital and well-being mm. interventions have actually been developed more and more since lockdown and still yeah. been continued now so hopefully that will be a useful tool so as you can see there's lots lots to do still mm. absolutely fascinating though and just all the different ways that you've been able to capture and yeah. analyze yeah. the information and respond into the sort um, of changing landscape of covid and things as well yeah, mm. yeah exactly and also trying to do it indirectly. That was really important yeah. to the team. When we look at some of the measures of like post-traumatic stress for children. Some of the mm. questions are very correct, even like lists of horrible things they might have seen that they tick. And, okay. and we didn't really want to use those kinds of measures. And we didn't yeah. want children to feel like we were studying them as such. So yeah. trying to be really yeah. sensitive to the power imbalance as well. Like, please fill in this questionnaire when they might yeah. not want to or might um difficult even to respond to those some of the questions which are quite invasive so we tried to um make almost make it so the children were unaware that there was any evaluation or going on yeah. obviously they knew they were part of a project but we didn't directly ask them to provide information in many traditional ways yeah well it, i mean it sounds really human you know the way you've all described it, it certainly sounds more sort of human centered than um than sort of research focused so although obviously it's really important to capture and um you know and, and finish this as a piece of research that be useful in so many different ways the way that you've all talked just sounds so human and you can really see the benefits of of the children who've been involved and the communities so that that comes across and I'm sure the participants who are you know who watch this will all think the same um, I'm just aware that we're coming to the end because um, we've had quite a, a deep discussion, haven't we, this morning. I'm just wondering about capturing um, next steps before before we move on to the closing. I, I don't know, Michael, if you want to say something. Uh, sure. So um, I'll say something quickly and then other people can kind of go on. Um, obviously, oh, yeah. we're all sort of... Um, you know, individuals who will pursue sort of subsequent yeah. activities based on this. Um, but as a, as a team, we're doing two things. I could speak to that. Uh, one is we're trying to do a follow on fund impact and engagement project, which would take the activities and the learning that we've uh, accomplished in, in Pulwama and take it to other parts of Kashmir, other parts of India, as well as internationally. So we were going to hopefully spend the, you know, the following year doing quite a bit more outreach and dissemination and refining some of the outputs that we've produced and working with communities in conflict areas and, and organizations uh, to, to uh, explore this idea further. Um, so that, that would be a big uh, step and maybe Vikraman and Rupa or others can talk about that if they want. Um, but also, um, I'm working with my university as well as others on the team to, to create uh, either a social enterprise or a charity, um, it's looking like, that would be yeah. able to offer this kind of activity uh, more widely, um, you know, yes. outside of academic funding, which is yeah. a big restriction to, you know, mm -hmm. I want to do this pretty much everywhere that needs yeah. it. And um, so the academic funding isn't the, isn't the route for that. So that's a, that's a sort of uh, step uh, going on, but you know, Vikram and Arupa and others can speak to wh where they want to take. There's lots of different routes being developed, but yeah. that's 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Vikram, do you want to try the second there? We'll go down the screen. Yeah. So, so the thing we we realize, and and that comes to the teachers, that we actually thought that um, if we could sort of move now to start looking at how we can institutionalize the methodology within schools, how we mm -hmm. could sort of the workbook being written, in a sense, I'm writing it, uh, yeah. where we could sort of lay, um, you know, have a certain script, a certain kind of a process, um, take our learnings and, uh, you know, and put that across. So to to train a bunch of teachers in uh, different schools and um, so that we create frontline uh, work or educators. So my, I, uh, I mean, actually both Anrupa and I sort of discussed a lot about this and we both think that it would be, how how can we leave something behind where the work carries on? And that's the idea. So student-led art space project, but but most of all, what my, um, but what I what I feel that um, it's 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 important to create special educators in school, like we have special educators in Delhi who are working with special children. Is it possible to look at special educators within the within the school system, where they are actually where, where you know when a child is actually not just being you know, you know, misbehaving or something of that sort or but primarily just acting out, you know, or understanding that their lack of, you know, not able to learn up um, so much of the academic sort of stuff is not because they are, you know, um, you know, they're not good at studies or good at academics, but because they have difficulty in concentration and, and, and focusing because that there's a high degree of PTSD. So how how do you sort of work this out? And how can neural pathways be reworked? How can memories be re reassessed? reassessed? Yeah. How can when there is a certain crisis take place within a school, a mental health crisis, or someone getting into self-harm or vandalization, you not come down on, on, on a, in a disciplinary way, but actually hold them with compassion, hold yeah. them with kindness, and essentially see that the person is actually, the child is actually acting out. So this is the kind of work we want to sort of put into schools so that mm -hmm. we leave our traces behind, you know? Yeah. And at the same time, of course, there is the arts-led aspect, you know, which is, of course, uh, Andrew Pub will talk about. But this is something where, as from a therapist or a therapeutic eye, is what I want, would like to sort of institutionalize, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, Nicola, I know we've just been, is there anything else you want to add that we've not covered from your point of view? No, I think we've covered most of it. Yeah. Just, um, going forward is um, Michael and I have just started working on a scoping project to think, to think about how we can apply what we've learnt to local situations. So um, there's a growing desire to um, create arts workshops through social prescribing for children in, in Bristol and nationally. So we're beginning a scoping project to look at what that might look like, what kind of services might young people and children want, mm. and what might the barriers be and the challenges in, in embedding that within a social prescribing model in the UK. So, so we're yeah. trying to look at what we've learned about using the art to improve children's well-being to look at how that could be be used here so social prescribing like referring people to art workshops for adults yeah. has been really burgeoning in the uk as a way to mm -hmm. improve psychosocial well-being but it hasn't happened so much for children so and young people so we're we're trying to look at learn about do a scoping project about how we could go about implementing that yeah, I, that's great. Because I was, I was thinking that I was thinking that there's so much learning um, for the as well, isn't there, around around this work? And you know, clinically, I work in prisons, and um, even you know, thinking within the prison environment, and um, and some of the trauma that people bring into prisons with them, and how beneficial this would be. So, um, would that be Bristol focused? The scoping exercise you're talking about. Um, yeah, we're we're going yeah. to focus. It's just a small project internally funded by UE, which yeah. is great, and like a seed funding to 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 learn locally what the yeah. what the challenges what the and needs, might be yeah. 
with the aim of writing a bigger project um but first yeah. part of it, learning what that project will be from yeah. young people and, and people on the ground so yeah that's really exciting thank you um and and we could just go over to you next yeah well um as far as uh the the future of this work is concerned of course like michael mentioned there is the uh, a, a discussion between him, Vikram, and I about the social enterprise and looking to do a follow-on project where focusing on teachers in Kashmir. Um, but I've been also trying to look at arts collectives and museums in mm -hmm. uh, 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 across India. I'm working with one of the arts collectives called Devi Arts Foundation with another project with children. Uh, and we have four of the children from the school in Kashmir and we have six children from New Delhi, uh, from two different schools. And it's to look at um, could existing art projects or uh, art works of art done by artists, including photographs, sculptures, um, be looked at to, to look at uh, narratives of well-being and narratives of uh, reconstructing one's own narratives and what kind of arts could children develop responding to um, you know existing artworks by professional artists and digital artists and mm -hmm. uh, visual yeah. artists. And it's been very exciting because the project is for uh, schools, uh, school uh, children, and then uh, again focuses on teachers and building uh, then a support curriculum for teachers um, which enables them to use the arts in their classrooms very directly to address situations in the school, especially in a post-COVID world where children are feeling increasingly isolated. Teachers are feeling very challenged about teaching on Zoom. Yeah, um, They have to rebuild a community with the parents, with the children, uh, and, and it has to be a support structure. Yeah. Could the art be that support is the question that we are primarily asking. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what uh, I've also been working on. And with both Kashmir and New Delhi in focus uh, uh, currently. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can totally see, like you, like we were saying earlier about some of the challenges about children um, opening up. And then you've got the added um, difficulty of children then opening up via technology as well. Um, very, very difficult. But again, the way of the future and the positives around, you know, being able to reach people through technology. So it's, um, yeah, it's a bit of a mixed bag, isn't it, really? Yeah, but, the, the biggest learning from the Art of Healing project was that the hybrid model really works. So, yeah. you know, the physical presence does something, but you can ensure a longevity through the digital model. Uh, mm -hmm. We could manage this uh, you know, a, a combination of three physical visits and then a far more, a far longer sustained digital interface with the children. And what they built is a eight month long project instead of just these sporadic interfaces. And of course, the physical interfaces are very powerful and there's no replacing those. But yeah. this kind of an add on digital interface really gives you uh, the possibility of a longer engagement yeah, uh, yeah. and it's more possible uh, in a in a let's say a politically a difficult to access area yeah. um, or a physically difficult to access area Vikram and I were doing a project for teenagers in a very uh, poor uh, two very poor states of India in Bihar and UP only digitally uh, because this was bang in the middle of the COVID crisis in North India yeah. And it was possible. Um, so yeah. I think uh, that the possibility of the yeah. So for you, it's created a lot of opportunities, really, using technology, which is which is really interesting. Yeah. Um, so we are coming to the end. I know. Um, I'll just say again to people who are listening, there is a website that you can have a look at for more information, which is artofhealing.org.uk. So do have a look at, at that. Um, I don't know are any of our, are you any of you on Twitter as well? If people want to um, want to address anything to you on Twitter, um, Nicola, maybe you are. Oh, yeah. Are you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. My um, yeah, do you want my Twitter handle is <laughs> yeah. So for people listening, yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't design it for sharing publicly, so now I'm embarrassed. But anyway, it's um, <laughs> creative. <laughs> Creative psyche. So I thought of that one. Yeah. It has a bit. Creative psyche 
P S Y. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. I, I have a sort of uh, massive sort of distrust of social media, so I've never really completely yeah. embraced it myself. Well, um, as well, you know, people can address us via the MHTV hashtag as well, and um, we're happy to pass on any questions to yourselves if that's okay. Um, but like I say, if people also want to have a look at the website, as well that would be great so we're coming to the end so i think um before we end it'd be good to just go around and get any final thoughts from everybody if that's okay so i will start at the top again with michael um final thoughts is just it was it's just been amazing really to work with everyone and um i feel lucky to have been involved and there's so many times when i watched the artwork or or, or looked at what was happening that i was really emotionally moved um, so I'm really, really proud about what happened and um, I find it um, really important work and I hope to be able to do more of it. Thank and you. thank you for having us. Yeah, no, thank you. It's been, honestly, it's been a privilege having you all here today. It's been absolutely fascinating from our point of view and I think people will be really interested um, once we put the recording online as well. Um, so Vikram, over to yourself, any final thoughts that you want to share before we finish? Um, well, I, I think um, um, for me, the project has been a, a sort of, a, um, I wouldn't say a culmination, but almost like a kind of a summary of all the work I have done in the state before um, for so many years. So it brought and it made me less lonely um, because I had a community of workers with me who was working with me. I, had, I could I could write mails and letters and share and, and that was wonderful. And to I keep having these meetings um, um, across the world mm, and also to, uh, to, um, to, to, to I felt you feel very privileged that I could be part of a conduit. So where the children's voices and their visuals could be shown to the rest of the world. And I think it's a, it's it's been a very and it's been the whole the whole experience has been miraculous the way it worked out. So I can't be you know I can't be more grateful to the universe for letting it happen. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, um, Nicola. Um, yeah, just to reiterate what everyone said, it was really amazing project and the way that everybody adapted to the changing situation with COVID and everything was really amazing and interesting. And we were in lockdown, but yet still communicating with everyone and, mm. and doing everything and the project was carrying on. Mm. And it was really fun to be involved with. And yeah, I think just the message that I think art interventions can be amazingly powerful and healing interventions. And I've really want to carry on doing research to understand what's going on there and to do yeah. more research with that going forward yeah thank you that's great and um finally Anna Ruth, do you want to um share any final thoughts with us as well well I'm, i just mostly echo what everyone else said uh just to add that uh, uh, there are people in the project, I felt really supported by uh, people in the project who I haven't met physically. I've only seen them via Zoom. Yeah, that's and, nice. and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so that, that was really special that there was a team uh, you could access. Uh, there was a time when you would think of only physically meeting people and it's possible yeah. to do this across the world yeah. and to do this uh, digitally. That was That's something I'm very grateful for and for this opportunity to meet these wonderful uh, group of children uh, who yeah. I'm still in touch with and just the possibilities yeah. it opens up and the excitement that some of them might be artists in the future. That really yeah. uh, <laughs> makes me uh, makes me happy. Yeah, that is amazing, isn't it, as well? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I mean, from, from our point of view, you know, it has been, a, a, you know, I genuinely mean it that it's been an absolute privilege to hear about the work that you've done and you know on so many levels you know on the arts level on the sort of international level but also you know thinking about um how this relates to work that we do in the UK as well and I appreciate as well you all coming on to talk to us today given the time differences and and that we've recorded this session to kind of allow for it to happen which has been which has been great. And, um, you know, for people who are listening, um, you know, do get in touch if you've got any questions and do have a look at the um, Art of Healing website as well and have a look at some of the art 
um, that the children have done hope to have heard about today because that sounds amazing as well and um and yeah i think that's it for us so just to say again thank you all thanks thanks for joining us today and um goodbye thank you okay, thank you bye bye thank you bye thanks so much